Martin Luther King Jr. had said, we must keep moving. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Therefore, uh, let's move on to our program. Uh, today, leader will be myself, uh, Vesel Kuro, and greetings will be brought to us by Veda Donenel, before that, a uh, special prayer and word of encouragement by our pastor Bebo, senior pastor, Chantan Baptist Church, Minister Hill. And then speech by Ms. Autula and then Ms. Bebo Tolet. Then we'll have a short break along with light refreshment. And then we'll come for interactive session, Q&A session. We have given you uh, a small slip so uh, I want you to write down uh, any questions, any queries that you have, okay? You can pass it to us for us to, you know, say it on your behalf, or also you can ask uh, by yourself also, that's fine, all right? So now I give time to our Pastor Bebo to share uh, a word of I bring the greetings and salutation on behalf of the church leaders here in Pohima. I want to thank the uh, founders the, of the uh, Maverick uh, Academy for inviting me to be here. And my greetings and salutation to the two resource persons and uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, cream of our society who are here today. So I bring greetings. Before I pray, I want to uh, uh, encourage you uh, with uh, something that has been on my mind uh, lately. And that is redefining our faith and Christianity, how we do Christianity in our uh, state, if not the Christian states in uh, every part of the country. We have uh, come to this stage where uh, confronting so many issues and it is also high time that we look at ourselves and redefine our faith and our Christianity and how do we respond to the issues around us as Christians. For example, I was uh, in uh, Manitou yesterday with a team and uh, neighboring state in spite of all our, our weaknesses they have also seen, and yet in a time such as this, are uh, eagerly waiting for our response. How do the Christian people in Nagaland, how do the Christians in Nagaland respond to our conflict? And um, we have also been uh, silent for quite some time, and uh, so there is no mediocrity here. And we have realized that uh, uh, we need to do uh, so many uh, things to, to, to address to this issue, but the best that we can do is to intercede as, as Christians so that uh, we uh, uh, 
uh, in, we pray for peace and prosperity and peaceful coexistence to live as neighbors. God tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves, and that is one of the very ways. And so, Lord, we celebrate their lives and their victories, and so, Lord, their achievement, we are here to acknowledge you and uh, also pray that many other young people who are here today will follow suit. And we pray that the Maverick Academy will be a breakthrough in so many ways. And so we pray for cohesion, we pray for understanding, and we pray for resources as well. Bless the Academy and bless the gathering today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Next, we have Vedas uh, Zonenan co-founder of Mavericks Academy to share about uh, Mavericks Academy and also to bring greetings to you all. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for making your time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. We are really grateful from the core of our hearts, and we believe that today's program will be a program where we can all take back home something of value and wisdom that we can apply, which we can reap benefits in our life. Uh, first of all, let me just congratulate my uh, uh, my team, uh, Brother Mamu here. Please, can you please stand up? He recently cracked the NPSC assistant. <laughs> And we also have, I don't know whether my uh, Chotazo, is Chotazo here? Chotazo, yes, he's at the back, right at the back. He recently became an assistant professor, so I just want to give a round of applause. So, uh, just wanted to start off with that. Uh, so, the main reason why uh, we, conduct, we have conducted this seminar today because I believe I want to see many young and others becoming civil servants, bureaucrats, and not only civil servants and bureaucrats, but much beyond that as well. Maybe as entrepreneurs as well. So let me just start by saying, why did we come up with the name Mavericks? In order to answer that, let me just give you the dictionary meaning of Mavericks. According to the dictionary, a Mavericks denotes a person who is bold, daring, unorthodox, unconventional, a person who is willing to defy and go beyond conventions, traditions, and precedents. In the same way, we believe we started our institution because we also want to create an institution which is unique in our methodology, in our functioning, so as to impart the best quality education to our students. And see if you can see the logo here. We, see we have a crown as, a, as well as a wings, right? So even that also has a significant meaning. Example, the crowd signifies dignity, royalty, because we believe that as Christians, we are called to be royal priesthoods in our lives. That's what the Bible says. We have to be priests, royal priesthoods. So I believe the crown represents the manifestation of the dignity and the kingdom of God here on earth, as well as the wings represents vitality, strength, endurance, perseverance. Okay, so uh, our institution, we wanted, to, uh, we, we have a vision which we want to see imparted into many of our young people. For example, one of our vision is to uh, raise up a generation of young people who has the heart, heart of excellence in whatever capacity they may be, because today we need people of excellence in our state. There has been so much mediocrity in our states that we need people of excellence to rise up in our state. That's what I feel. And the next is, we also want people, those who are bold, to stand out rather than fit in. See, today, in a society and culture which uh, inculcates, uh, which tries to ingrain in us conformity. We are all, we, we are all expected to conform in society, but God expects us to stand out in life. See, unless you can be bold, how can you be the south? How can you be the city on the hill? You have to be willing to be bold. So we want to raise up a generation of young people, those who are bold and those who can stand out. And we also want to ingrain in our young people not only the art of impartation and acquisition of uh, acquisition of knowledge, but also to shape and mold them into developing officer-like qualities, temperaments, and sensibilities, even when they are experienced. 
because I'm reminded of what one, one of my friends who is an IDS officer now, another, uh, he said to me, what he said to me was very good. We become officers even before we see our name printed on the flag list. So I believe you have to become an officer. You have to wear the gown of an officer first before you become an officer. And next is, uh, we also want to inculcate in our students the ability to think critically, the ability to analyze objectively, the ability to develop a rational bend of mind towards problem solving skills and all of those things. So um, we also, our, our, our vision is also to impart numerical, verbal, and linguistic fluency in our students. Because see, uh, many of our students, one thing I see common in Nagaland is that we are trained up in the road learning of, uh, road system of learning where memorization and uh, memorization of facts has become quite common. So we want to create a different pattern in which we want the students to think objectively and critically. And the way to do that is to speak. And the way to do that is to write. Because writing is the best way to develop critical reasoning. There is no other method better than writing to develop critical reasoning. So that is what we want to impart in our students as well. And the next, most importantly, we want also to invite in our students the ability to embody the Christian values and principles, like empathy, sympathy for your fellow beings, as well as, above all, to adorn the cloth of servitude, which should be the hallmark of any public service. Because see, the whole point of being a public servant is to serve, which we have somehow lost over the years. Serving is the core ethos, ethos of the civil service. So, we also want to inculcate in our students about those things. So just to end this uh, small uh, thing, before I move on to the technical aspect, I just want to end with this. This is what I got it from my church. Uh, I just want to end with this thought that is, it is said that quality leaders are prepared in the wilderness. It is in the wilderness that our motives are purified, our backbones are solidified, and our visions and callings are clarified. So, uh, before that, we want to uh, give a small token of appreciation. Okay, uh, yeah. This To our pastor Bebo. And in the second part, I'll share with you just some practical tips about uh, UPSC CSC preparation in general. So regarding my background, I was born and brought up in Iran, and from where I did my schooling. And when I was around, when I was in uh, around class five, class six, my father introduced this idea and this concept of civil services as a career option to me and my siblings. Uh, somehow. I have, a, uh, I have four other siblings. Somehow, I think from among us, it was uh, the civil services as a career option. It just struck a special chord in my heart. 
and then it was just during the back of my mind I felt like maybe this is my area of God maybe this is something that the Lord would want me to do so that was what I um, had it in the back of my mind as a child and uh, when I was around class 8 or class 9 my father used to subscribe this magazine called Competition Success Review I don't know if you're aware of that magazine or not back then I did not have the vocabulary or the understanding to even read the magazine and to get out of the, mag the magazine. But in the magazine, there used to be a section where towards the front of the magazine where they used to publish the transcripts of this UPSC interview of uh, CSE TOEFL. So I somehow grew up reading that and you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, Shalom, one day I'll give civil services. Uh, this is something that I want to do with my life as well. So. Actual preparation started after graduation only. I graduated in the year 2016 from St. Anthony's College and I did my uh, BA in History Honors. Right after my graduation, uh, in the month of July, I went to Delhi and I took coaching for around 10 to 11 months from uh, ALS. So when it comes to coaching, uh, I just want to share you know, some, uh, some things about coaching. Not everyone would recommend coaching, some would recommend coaching, but for me personally, coaching did play an important part in my uh, preparation. It's like, not every coaching institute is perfect in the sense that um, some coaching would be good in one area or say they would excel in one area of service. Another coaching might provide better services in some certain area. And coaching in itself is, uh, it's not an end in itself in the sense that just because uh, you're attending a coaching doesn't guarantee you success but for me personally it uh, played a very important role in laying that foundation and that groundwork because for me from my uh, if you look at my background I don't have anyone from my uncle from my mom's side or from my dad's side who ever sat for this uh, civil services exam so in terms of guidance and in terms of um, advice also, I had no one to uh, guide me. And you know, back then in 2016, I don't think we had a lot of uh, online courses or uh, I wasn't very aware about the YouTube channels offered by uh, UPSC toppers to guide students as well. So for me, coaching played a very important role in just uh, giving me that foundation, a solid foundation and subsequently in the years that followed when I was doing self-study, I could build upon what I had learned from the coaching institute. Uh, yeah, regarding the number of attempts, I gave six attempts. This was my sixth attempt. In my first three attempts, I could not clear prelims. In my fourth attempt, I cleared prelims, gave names, gave interview, but did not find my name in the final list. Fifth attempt, again, I could not clear prelims. And I found out later on that, you know, in prelims, we have two papers. We have general studies paper, and then we have the CSAT paper. So I found out that I cleared paper one, but I had made a missed um, CSAT cutoff by like around zero point something something. And then uh, this was my sixth attempt. So I have had a lot of ups and downs in this journey. And I'm so glad that, you know, our servant is only shared about the wilderness and how God uses this time to prepare us. So I have had the lowest of the lowest moments, uh, time, most depressing moments when I wanted to give up on life. And in fact, the fourth and the fifth attempt, when I did not make it to the final list, and then when I did not clear prelims, that for me was the, I think, the lowest moment of my life. It was in the year 2021. So that year, I packed up my bags. I was in, I was in Delhi all this time. I had hardly come home as well. I packed my bags, just came back home, and. I seriously thought about what was going on in my life and I couldn't understand why I was going through so much of failure, why despite all the hard work I had put in, it just wasn't working out for me. And I had a lot of questions to God also, like did I make the right choice, the dream that he put in my heart, did I make a mistake listening to him or is this the right career option for me? Because civil services is not the only alternative, like if this doesn't work for me, you can always find some other alternative to serve God and then you know, to find, a, um, to find your calling. So 
2021, after I came back home, I gave NPSC prelims. Somehow I found the strength to give NPSC prelims. And then I sort of took a break and I was just home and I spent a lot of time with my mother and my father in prayer and then in conversation. And we talked about it, we prayed about it. You know, should I sit for this exam again? And since I was home and my church members came to know, so my pastors and then church leaders, a lot of them came to visit me and they just poured into my life words of encouragement and prayers. And I found out that I needed emotional healing as well because I was so broken and so discouraged. And somehow by the grace of God, I found the strength to come to the decision that I was gonna sit for this exam one last time. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then I'll accept uh, I'll accept the reality and I'll accept it that maybe God has a better plan for me. So 2022 was like a year of breakthrough for me. Um, God just opened one door after the other. Uh, it was a very hectic year as well, like NPSA prelims, UPSA prelims. It's just, you know, the whole year I was giving NPSC and UPSC side by side. So last year I cleared NPSC. Uh, currently I'm working as a secondary assistant posted in school education department. And this year, by the grace of God, I uh, cleared uh, UPSC after six attempts. And uh, a lot of emotions went through my mind when I saw my name in the list. But you know, one thing at the back of my mind was so clear. I knew that God had, has blessed me, not just for myself, but he has remembered my family, he has remembered my siblings, he has remembered my relatives, every single one that has prayed for me. And he also remembered perhaps all those people that would be blessed through my life when they come to hear my story one day. So I accept it as a great responsibility. Uh, so excited for the new journey ahead. A little bit scared as well, but you know, very thankful to God. I'm taking a lot of time, I guess, but I'll just, uh, we'll come to the second part of the talk, which is like practical tips about uh, this UPSC preparation. I'll just quickly go over it. You know, our man Bevo will be sharing with you later on, and I'm sure she'll share with you her success strategy. Today, I actually just came with a lot list of mistakes that I have done. Uh, a lot of things that I uh, did wrong in my preparation that I would like to share with you so that you don't repeat them. And uh, as an elder sister, okay, as somebody who has gone through this journey ahead of you, and I will try to be um, as honest with you as possible. So just a few points, I'll quickly go over it. Firstly, I think for any competitive exam, doesn't matter whether it's UPSC or NPSC, the syllabus and the previous year question papers are key to understand. It's like a window for you to understand what the exam is all about. And I've heard so many toppers say this, that you, uh, syllabus and previous year question paper refer to it again and again. And somehow for me, what I did was, in my first few attempts, what I did was, I would just glance through the syllabus and the PYQs, which is which is uh, not what the toppers, I believe, are suggesting. When we say syllabus and previous year question paper, it's, you know, if you collect the previous year question paper, it's it would be quite bulky. And it's not something that glancing once or twice, you, you will not be able to make out or you will not be able to get the best out of it. You have to break down the syllabus, you have to break down the PYQs, break it into manageable parts, analyze it, and then try to understand uh, what you can get out of it. So that way, whenever you study a topic or whenever you are starting with a new book, if you have the syllabus and the PYQs in the back of your head, the time that you spend studying that topic becomes much more productive. And this is not something that will happen when you glance through it just once or twice or just say occasionally. Your syllabus and your PYQs need to be on the table where it's very accessible and you need to go through again and again and again. And these days you have, um, when you talk about PYQs also, they have you know broken down it into top, uh, based on the topics and based on the year. So it's much more easier for you to read. So whenever you study a new topic or whenever you're reading a new book, always go back to the PYQs and the syllabus. Uh, these are your guide, this will be your best friend because in competitive exam what happens is that the syllabus is so general, so comprehensive, the only way you can break it down into manageable parts is when you know what's being asked or what's the trend. So that's the first thing that I want to say. Second thing is um, basic books and conceptual clarity. I always uh, heard people say that, you know, limit the number of books that you have to read and then instead of reading many books, like one book over and over and over again. And I kind of took it so literally that the number of books that I read in my first attempts were just too few. Um, 
you need to make a list of the books that you think and you know is important. A lot of blogs are here available online, and if you join coaching, then I'm sure the your teachers will recommend the number of books that you have to read. But it's like uh, if you and and also if you look at the list of the books that the toppers have read, you would see that it's quite lengthy. The list is quite lengthy. So when it comes, so I made the mistake of reading too few books. In my first attempt, I have not even read Lakshmi Khan and Spectrum. <laughs> which is a blunder actually. So you shouldn't make those mistakes. List out the books you want to read, and then your basic books should be so clear. And these are the books that you should be going through over and over and over again. Basic books are the books that you should be reading cover to cover. And then those, are, those should be the books that should you know, lay your foundation for conceptual clarity. Once you have done that, you would come to know, despite knowing or studying the basic books so well, the exam will still ask questions, the UPSC or NPSC will still ask questions that's nowhere in your basic books. So then comes the supplementary materials that is mainly, that's for value addition, to add to the wealth of knowledge that you already have, that's already covered by basic books. So that should be so clear. The list of books that you should be reading to cover to cover, and then the materials that you may be referring to it once or twice, make notes for value addition. So that was something I did not know. Um, Basic books, man. I, I, so I read too few books in the beginning. Uh, again, I would just want to say focus on completion of topics rather than completion of books. Because for coaching, uh, sorry, for UPSC or NPSC, you would come to know that there is. It's very difficult to find one book that will cater to the entire syllabus. Like some books, you have to read it very thoroughly. Some books, some books, you need to just you know pick up some few topics. So again, here also. Uh, the syllabus, PYQ, becomes so important to know what to read from a book, what not to read. Um, second, uh, thirdly, let's come to note making. Uh, here also, I made a lot of mistakes. I had to learn the art of note making all over again. You know, when you're in college, the way you make notes, the way you study is so different from what the exam, the uh, uh, exam like civil services requires. And um, the sort of notes that I made was just purely the college, college style. <laughs> and over time, I came to realize that my notes were becoming redundant. Like by the time I come for, by the time I come for, uh, by the time I do my third, fourth revision, I'll find out that you know I know much better than what's there in my notes. So my notes are not really useful. And also, uh, for some books, it's just impossible to make notes. Like let me say, uh, let me give the example of Lakshmikan Indian Polity. There's just too many information there that even if you make notes, the source material is always going to be better than your notes. So I made a lot of blunder. I would make, spend a lot of time making notes to find out that these notes aren't really useful or these notes aren't, you know, it's not going the right way. So I wasted a lot of time as well. Uh, so when it comes to note making, I would just say, know the purpose of note making. You don't have to make notes of everything. There are some where the source material will always be better. An example for current affairs magazine also. If the coaching institutes are putting in so much of hard work to prepare those materials for you, then you don't have to you know, uh, add in more hours to make notes out of it. You can always directly refer uh, to the source material. And But if you're somebody who really needs uh, notes, uh, just for revision, then it's like make notes once you are thorough with the topic. That way your notes will become so effective because you know what to include and what not to include. If you make notes in your first reading or second reading, everything will be so important that you will want to include everything. Uh, or you might not know how, what to segregate or what notes to make out from that material. So that's something that I would, you know, from my experience, I'd like to share. So towards the end, my notes would include, you know, pointers, a collection of data, a lot of diagrams, but since I made those notes after many, many readings, those were exactly what I needed for last moment revision. Uh, and those are the notes that I referred to in the last few weeks of Berlitz and Mates. So, okay. Mm. Fourthly, uh, talk a little bit about your analyzing your strengths and your weaknesses. Uh, first, for we, we all have our different strengths and weaknesses. Like some people are good in MCQ, some are better in answer writing. For me, I am terrible when it comes to MCQs. This is one area where I struggled so much. Uh, that's why I feel prelims so many times as well. And over time, what happened was that I developed this fear of prelims. 
It's like I've never been so crippled by fear when it comes to writing exams. But because I feel prelim so many times, you know, it's almost, I don't want to make, a, I don't want to use the word lightly, but it's almost like a panic attack no? when prelims approaches or when I think about prelims. And it, it's like, for me, even at this point, I wouldn't be so confident that like if I were to write UPSC again, maybe I'll still be scared of prelims. So I don't exactly, I'm not very confident also when it comes to sharing prelims tips. I can always, I can only say that it's by the grace of God, I somehow managed to clear prelims. But there were some things that I did for prelims because I knew this was my area of struggle. Um, one was finding the number of questions that is right for me. Like for some, some people, if they, like they need to answer, uh, sorry, they need to attempt many questions if they want to clear. Some are very good in their accuracy that even if they solve, say, 50, in UPSC we have 100 questions. If they solve 50 questions also, they can still manage the cutoff. For me, my accuracy wasn't great. My, um, what's that? Uh, my risk-taking ability wasn't good either. So I couldn't do many questions, but I also couldn't you know, limit myself to very few questions. So over time, I found out that the question, the number of questions that work for me is like from 65 to 70. So that's the number of questions I prepared myself to attempt mentally when it comes to prelims. So I think it's very important. Some will say, do this much, do this that much, but you have to know your strength. And if you're somebody struggling in prelims, then you really need to um, find out that number of questions that works for you. And that will come after solving tests multiple times. You just cannot, you know, uh, just give tests multiple times and then see for yourself, analyze yourself. Second thing is I did a lot of tests and writing tests is just one part of it. It's not fi even 50% of it. And this is something I realized after my first and second attempt. Say for example, you spend two hours writing tests, then you need to spend around three to four hours analyzing that test. Studying that test, revising the test, making notes out of that test. Try to see how many questions from history you are able to attempt, how many questions you're getting it right. And, and for me, I found out that I thought I was so good in polity, but I was making a lot of mistakes in polity. So I found out that you know, I had to do a lot of revision. So that way, a lot of analysis, a lot of uh, carefully studying, and that, that's how I tried to, you know, uh, so, uh, deal with my weakness in prelims. And daily MCQs is one thing. I went online and did daily MCQs every day because I knew I was bad at MCQs. And there are a lot of um, uh, online materials available for daily MCQs. I used to follow Drishti um, Insights on India and GK Today. So I was following those. For mains, test series played a very important role. For some reason, I think I was more comfortable with answer writing. Test series played a very, very important role. I used to align my timetable and my strategy according to the test series. I think later on we can discuss in detail about that. Um, okay, I'll try to go a little quickly. Timetable and time management, I want to share with you about this. Uh, very important to set goals. Don't wake up one day and say, you don't, don't study according to your whims and your fancies. Like just because you feel like studying quality today, you study quality and tomorrow you study some other thing. It should be very clear in your mind, like this month I will study this, and then you divide it into weeks, and then you divide it into days. Uh, if you're attending coaching, then your timetable can be in alignment with what's being taught in the class. For me, I would divide my day into blocks and my weeks, uh, even my weeks also, and say plan the number of tests I will solve, the number of essays I will write, the number of topics I will cover. In a day, uh, I would divide my day into different different blocks, morning block, afternoon block, evening block, and night block. I'm most productive in the morning. So that's where, you know, three to four hours or even five hours would easily go into the morning block. And I don't take too many gaps. So I don't study for one hour and then I take a break. Don't study for two hours, take a break. So if it's three hours and it's solid three hours. Only for, you know, only when um, I need to drink water or go to the toilet, that's when I would take a break. So it's like solid three or four hours where I would do, and, and in this morning block, I would do the topic that's the most difficult for me or that I need the most concentration. And then after that block is over, I'll take a break. And then comes the afternoon block. Uh, this afternoon, if, if I study four hours in the morning, this will be reduced to at least three hours. And here I would do a little lighter topic uh, just to balance it out. Because if you're doing something very tough in the morning, then your mind can't carry you to do something very tough again. Then in the evening, it will be like around two hours. Here I would do some sort of you know practical, like practice answer writing, some, a little bit lighter. 
Then comes night, around one hour. I'm not a night person, I don't study at night. So this is where I don't. I spend the least amount of time studying and I do the lightest of the lightest topics, like just you know, daily MCQs, just browse on current affairs, just do a little bit of revision. So that's how I balance my day. So say if I say I'm studying eight to nine hours, it doesn't mean that all those eight to nine hours are spent in equal amount of concentration. It's like there's always a balance. That way it's, it isn't too difficult on your mind either. Even when it comes to the week, I use this app called Forest app to track my progress. Sunday is the day I take a break. Monday to Saturday I'm studying. And I found out that, you know, somewhere along the week I would lose my momentum. Like, it's not possible to put in 10 hours every single day. It's like one day or the other, it's just gonna get weak. For me, it's Thursday. Uh, Thursday or Wednesday, that's when, you know, I try, I, I lose my energy a little bit. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if I'm putting in eight hours, then on the day when I feel weak, I don't pressure myself to put in the same eight hours. That I would reduce it to say maybe five hours or maybe four and a half hours. And again, because I'm tired and a little bit demotivated, what I would do is I wouldn't go for those very difficult subjects. I would go for the lighter topics that I love doing, uh, that I love studying or reading maybe. And then on this, on, on those sort of, sort of days, I would uh, just browse, research, collect essay topics, um, uh, collect some data and then you know just try to do spend my time productively but not too much pressure on myself and then get an early rest and next morning you can wake up and you can go on the same momentum so if we talk about consistency this is how i try to manage consistency don't try to break the continuity even though every day is not the same and some days you're going to feel very tired you have to know how to take care of your mind and your body as well uh, and then at one point or the other you have to get used to the boring routine of doing the same things over and over and over again. For every aspirin, I think this is one thing that I would, uh, you know, uh, I would like you to remember, because uh, a lot of our social life, I'm pretty sure your social life, you'll have to cut down, you have to make a lot of sacrifices, you have to spend day in and day night studying, and. I think uh, for me, after six months, it became so tiring. It's like first three, four months, you're high on Josh. But after some time, there will be a point when you'll get so exhausted. That's when you know you have to train your mind and you have to get into, you just have to just get used to the boring stuff. It, it, it should become a habit. And then you should, in fact, be uncomfortable when you're not studying anymore. It's like you need to reach that point. It takes some time. For me, it took six months. But even for you, that time will come. And just remember, you have to get used to doing the mundane, boring things over and over again. That should become a part of your lifestyle one, one time or the other. Um, we're coming to the end. I just here, I just want to talk about distractions. Um, see, preparing for this exam, it's a privilege and it's an opportunity. Doesn't matter where you end up. Uh, just check yourself after uh, a few years, like after one attempt, second attempt. Maybe some of you will clear in your first attempt, not everyone will clear in your first attempt. Some of you might clear, you know, uh, get into NCS, some will get into different service. It's just that the process itself is very transformative. The wealth of information, knowledge that you will gain, and then the values that you will learn, discipline, hard work, endurance, it will just change you as a person if you do it right. But you don't always have this time to prepare for exams. It's, like, it's just one part of your, uh, just, just one phase of your life. So while you have the time, I just want to encourage you, give everything that you can. Let go of any distractions, anything that you know can be a hinder in your preparation, in your studies. Don't set yourself up to fight your battles, to fight battles that you don't have to fight. Just let go. It's like free up space in your life so that you will have time to do the productive things, to do the important things. Uh, that's, some, that's a personal advice that I would like to give. And then take good rest as well. Be very particular about your emotional, mental, your spiritual and physical health. Um, always reach out for help if you need to. I know that you have to isolate yourself, but there's a difference between solitude and isolation. It's like... Uh, you don't have to, just because you're cutting down on your social life doesn't mean you cannot reach out for help. For me, I always had my parents, I always had my friends, and there are times I would talk for three or four hours just pouring out my 
frustration. And then hobbies also play a very important part for me uh, to deal with the stress in my life. So I think cultivate healthy habits, take care of yourself, and always reach out if you need for help. At the end, I just want to say that, you know, if your dreams are big, then the price that you have to pay is also big. The sacrifices that you have to make is also huge. Uh, just, um, and so, there is something that my, one of my pastor, who was my mentor, who sadly has gone to be home with the Lord, he used to always say this, that the traffic is always less in the last mile. Like when you are starting out, there will be a lot of people in that race starting along with you. Uh, somewhere along the middle, the number of people will get left. But towards the end, the last person standing is the one who has been able to go through the challenges, is able to endure, persevere, and put in the hard work. So the traffic is always left in the last mile, and I want to encourage all of you, try to be that person, like the last man or woman standing. Uh, God bless you all, and my best wishes to everyone. Thank you.